thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to expand on Jay's introduction and in that um, I, I do work for the University of Maine, which is um, part of a national cooperative extension system. I'm not sure if all of you are just from Maine or um, from chiming in from elsewhere. I've done some webinars earlier this season where um, I got a question about how to manage iguanas um, in a container garden. So it um, goes to show you that we have a broad reach. Actually, was um, giving garden advice to someone in Stockholm a couple days ago. So it's um, interesting times nowadays. Um, but if you are chiming in from other states, just know that there are cooperative extensions in every state in the United States. Um, and in Maine, um, we have a presence in every county too. Um, we have county um, offices in almost every single county, but um, if you don't have a county office, in your county, um, I just please know that there are staff um, there to support you. Um, and basically, um, we have experts who provide practical, locally based solutions for farmers, small businesses, uh, small business owners, kids, um, parents, and consumers, and, and many others. So um, our work is very varied. Um, my job is a, as a horticulturist is to support home and community and school gardeners through um, all their their uh, various efforts and hopefully um, help them find success. Uh, I see a lot of moldy tomatoes and yellow leaves in my, um, in my work, uh, but I also see a lot of really great positive things as well and hopefully um, we'll connect with all of you at some point in time or another. Um, but today um, I'm here to talk about ornamental garden gardening um, and next week I will talk about um, vegetable gardening. So hopefully if you if you came with a question, maybe we'll have some time to talk about that um, at the very end. Um, so uh, I'm here today at my office. This is, I think, the third time I've been at my office um, since March. <laughs> um, we are not officially open right now. Um, we're in the, the process of reopening, um, and that should happen in the near future, I hope. Um, but um, uh, we, I'm here to, because I have good internet access, quite frankly. But my other office, is Rogers Farm and um, some kind volunteers a few years ago came out with a drone and got these really stunning shots of um, the, the artwork that is done by our master gardener volunteers which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute um, every year. This was two years ago I believe and um, Rogers Farm is is located at 914 Bennick Road in Old Town and normally it is a demonstration garden that's open to the public seven days a week, sent up to sundown for folks to come um, on their own and um, informally just walk through the garden and learn from the garden. We try to do um, a good job with signage um, and, and, and talk about the work that we're doing um, to show best practices for the home garden. Um, right now, unfortunately, we are closed to the public um, and unfortunately, we do not have um, the capacity to have volunteers right now as well. We're trying to keep everyone safe. And so I'm the, also the, the groundskeeper this year. So it, it, I say that because it doesn't look this pretty this year. <laughs> um, I'm doing my best um, to, to keep, to triage the garden um, and keep it productive in terms of um, being able to still produce food for local shelters and food pantries, which um, about 50% of the garden, 40, 40 to 50% of the garden is typically planted for Maine Harvest for Hunger. And those volunteers um, usually yield about um, 3,000 pounds of food every year. I'm sure we won't do that um, this year, but um, we, we are committed to um, helping address food insecurity and especially um, so now. So I think that that's going to ramp up in the next year or so as far as our, um, our, our production there. Um, but we are committed to also uh, meeting the needs of ornamental gardeners and gardeners that are interested in native plants as well. So we have about 50% of the real estate in that demonstration garden that's dedicated to that purpose. And um, really, um, it's, I admire the work of both groups of volunteers. They do incredible, incredible things. Um, and so I'm going to bring you into the garden virtually by showing some pictures and a few videos, but I'm also going to um, show you a few videos from another um, garden legend in Orono. Got, to, um, got permission to go see her and do some taping for our Master Gardener volunteer training this fall. And um, so you'll get a couple um, quick peeks as to what her garden looks like as well. 
Um, before I dive in real quick, I'm going to, um, basically, I'm going to do three things in the next, and, and talk as fast as I can, the next maybe 30 minutes or so, and we'll leave um, some time at the end for questions. But I'm going to go over resources. I'll give you some quick tips um, of things that you might want to do to enjoy your uh, uh, ornamental gardens a little bit more. And then um, I'll go into some plant profiles of things that you may not have considered adding to your landscape um, and, and why you might want to consider adding them to your landscape. So they're not your familiar ones that you've seen in your grandmother's garden there, um, or maybe you'd have, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, hopefully they'll, they'll inspire you to consider something new for your garden. So first, the resources. Um, I, are, when, you, when you have questions um, in the future and um, need research-based, reliable, unbased um, information, I highly recommend just putting in your search engine, humane gardening. Um, not humane gardening, but humane gardening as in the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Gardening. And that'll bring you right up to our Garden Yard website. I'm gonna try to um, escape out of here and bring that website up to you. So you, it'll be familiar to you when you go to um, look for it. Bear with me for just a moment here. I'm gonna do just what I said. And Jay, chime in if you don't see a, a website there. Or oh, see. we're watching you. Okay, perfect. Thing. It is so odd to not see faces during this whole thing. And this is actually when my computer is really so. Okay, there we go. Um, so the, it will bring you to this great um, website that has a load of information. I won't go over every single one, but you can click on this and ask a gardening question. And it's kind of like, it's not exactly live, but usually you'll get a response within 24 hours. Um, from our statewide team of folks that take turns answering these questions. You can also reach out to your county office as well. Um, we have a number of um, webinars. If you click on Growing Maine Gardeners, that's kind of our, our new website that um, shows some of the responsiveness that we've done um, to the COVID crisis and the changing um, nature of um, demand for gardening resources. So we have um, Victory Gardens for Me, which is a a series of 10, um, 15 minute uh, intensive uh, sessions on how to grow vegetables. Um, and they're really, really um, very detailed, uh, but very concise as well. We have a webinar series that you can sign up for. These are all free. You know, donations are you know, welcome, but they are definitely for free. So we just had choosing native plants for pollinators, for example. Um, and some of these you might be able to view um, as recordings uh, after the fact. So give me a shout if you are interested in any of these and happen to miss them. You can register for them and we'll get a recording for any of these um, afterwards if you happen to miss the actual live session. But the live sessions are really nice um, because you can ask questions right then and there. Um, the, the, if you missed the session with on AgriAbility last week, um, she's going to be doing the same presentation on August 31st, for example, at growing garlic, root cellaring, and we'll, we'll probably be bringing these in through the fall and possibly in the winter too um, for, for more topics. We're always talking about new ideas and um, addressing the needs of, of the gardening community. So, and I welcome your suggestions as well. Um, at, we have a garden mentorship program. So if you're looking for advice on um, specific type of gardening, we'll match you with master gardeners who will give you a call and chat about gardening and be your kind of on-call um, garden buddy. Um, it won't be in person, but it will be a very, um, you know, personal response to your gardening questions, which I think is a fun, um, fun way to go about educating the community. Um, we have videos, lots and lots of videos. So if you're looking to build a raised bed or a seed starting stand or prune your blueberries, you can definitely do um, any of that um, by watching our uh, video series. So a lot of on-demand educational resources. Um, so, and also a lot of ornamental ones. I'm giving lots of vegetable and edible examples, but how to prune your lilac, for example, or, you know, how to uh, deal with Japanese beetles uh, are really, really popular ones as well. So um, 
I'm going to try to get back to the PowerPoint now. I know where my mouse is. And while she's doing that, I'll just remind folks that we do have a chat function in this uh, Zoom that you should feel free to drop your questions and comments into. Um, any questions and comments you drop in throughout her presentation, we'll try to address. I'm planning on addressing at the end. <laughs> um, so put, as, as your questions pop to mind, please drop them in the chat. And just a reminder to find the chat, mouse over or touch your touch screen, and it'll bring up the Zoom menu in the lower part of your screen, and you should see a chat function. If you hit that, it'll open up a chat box that you can drop in questions, concerns, or comments that we can address toward the end. Great. Thanks, Jay. Um, so I mentioned the webinars, the videos, and, bul and bulletins are um, you know, fact sheets on a particular topic. So if you are wondering about how to deal with um, Japanese beetles, for example, um, and, and to find the fact sheet, you could just do a search for you mean Japanese beetles and it should come right up or you mean um, lily leaf beetle, for example, and it should come up and those offer management su suggestions, information about the biology of the um, pest for, for that example um, and, and so on. So um, again, we're out there and <laughs> we're just too hidden. So please also, I'll give you homework um, to, uh, to, to take a moment, um, find a resource and share it with a friend so other folks know about it as well. That's the favor I ask of all of you. Um, we also have the Maine Home Garden Newsletter, which is our statewide um, free monthly gardening newsletter that comes out uh, usually the first of every month. And um, I just finished editing um, the August one and I'm really excited about sharing that with the public. It should um, go live on Saturday. Um, we have uh, social media accounts, uh, Facebook and Instagram, numerous ones, um, but the one that I would love for you to follow are um, Rogers Farm Demonstration Garden. You can search for that either on either platform and find us and see lots of um, fun pictures. I did a weed picture yesterday of an edible weed. Um, so that'll hopefully be your teaser to go find that. <laughs> um, and um, the Master Gardener Volunteers is a big part of my work and I, I, I just, Big kudos to the group that um, has gone through the training this year because normally we have the training in person um, and uh, we had to quickly transition everyone to Zoom and they all did it such a, in such a graceful, positive way. Um, and we are going to be um, finishing up the training in September um, virtually as well. And so this is a 50 hour training and it's a train the trainer um, where we uh, basically uh, give a lot of in-depth gardening information on both edible and ornamental gardening um, and ask these volunteers to go out and um, spend 40 hours of their time on an educational or food security project in their community and they do such an amazing work. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, being able to gauge, engage them out in the community um, in the future uh, and and proud of the work that they've been doing in the meantime um, at home recording their work sharing pictures of their inspiring gardens um, and also mentoring other gardeners as well so it's been really fun to see how responsive they are and some of them serve as editors of our newsletter and contributors to our newsletter as well and then brand new is our virtual demonstration garden. Um, you're one of the first groups to actually hear about this. Our master gardeners heard about it, I think a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago. Um, but we just launched a new kind of crowdsourcing of, of, of photos um, because knowing that a lot of folks are spending more time at home and in their landscape, you have gorgeous gardens this year. Um, and so I want you to take pictures of your gardens, especially close up pictures of best practices or favorite plants um, that will help us educate and inspire other main gardeners. Um, and we will basically uh, uh, go through them, put up our favorites on our website, on our social media platforms, and use this as a resource because we've got a lot of gardening talent out in the community. It's not just us being the presenters, you should be the presenters as well and be proud of your work. And so I want to challenge all of you to consider taking a few pictures in your landscape. Um, this is a, a photo that was one of our first submissions from a master gardener down in York County. And I love it. It's just such an artful picture of a really um, wonderful raised bed garden um, that looks just like a treat to actually work in. My gosh, not even having to bend over. <laughs> Sounds really wonderful. Um, 
especially after working long hours at Rogers Farm. Um, so I, I hope that all of you can contribute photos and take a look at the photos that get submitted. Our collection isn't big right now, but um, hopefully by the winter when we're all um, looking forward to seeing green pictures, um, we'll have a lot for you to peruse through and get inspired by. And then um, very, very soon, we'll have a pollinator garden certification program. Um, this was supposed to be launched this spring, but we had to shift our, our plan of work um, to address other more urgent needs. Um, and so it's still been in the works, and I think we're ironing up the last few details of it, and we'll be launching it this fall. So um, there will be press releases out on that. Um, very soon and also a press release going out to on the virtual demonstration garden very soon so you'll see that in the newspapers and online and on our websites um, so with that said um, i'm going to bring you into rogers farm again <laughs> um, one of the things uh, with the story with the volunteer uh, with the, the volunteer issue at rogers farm not being able to have volunteers is I've had to really rethink um, what I can and cannot do with that two acre space that really needs to be maintained. So it's, I'm, I'm one of those folks that always bites off more than they can chew. It's just a, a fact and I, and I struggle with it every time in all aspects of my life, but with gardening especially. And so um, my thought going into the season was I was gonna focus my efforts on growing food um, and just triaging the plants that are there. We have a lot of beautiful um, perennial plants, so making sure that those don't get overwhelmed with weeds. Um, and what I found um, when I started working, especially in the front garden at Rogers Farm, the one that runs parallel to the, the road that it's on, um, is that there was a really rich history of, um, of past gardens that were showing up um, because of the seed bank that was in the soil already. Um, and those plants that were popping up were from plants that were year, in there years ago that had set seed and, and um, were normally would normally be considered weeds in that particular garden. And this year, I let those grow. And I was happy that I did because it was less space that I actually had to plant and it still provided some cheerful color. Although it was a little wild looking this year, I still think I'm, I'm very happy with the fact that it still had some bright cheerful colors. Um, and I would encourage you to do the same thing in certain spots. Um, the key is to not let too much uh, seed rain down into your garden after the fact. So um, very, very soon, probably in the next week or so, I'm gonna be pulling um, up the poppies that have just gone by. Bottom right-hand corner is a, um, an unknown variety of poppies that populated a big part of the front garden at Rogers Farm um, and making sure that those seeds don't go back all over the garden. There's probably still plenty of seeds in that soil seed bank that will pop up next year and I can choose to keep them and let them grow or not, depending on what the plan is for that front garden next year. Um, same with, I'll just go around, um, starting at the top right is, is dill. Um, dill can be quite the weed, but a beautiful weed and a useful weed in the garden. Um, that's all through that front garden. Um, again, uh, I'm going clockwise here. So we've got that bright purple poppy. Um, the bottom left is um, bachelor's buttons. Those are throughout the garden. Not as um, prolific as the poppies, but still um, uh, pretty, pretty present. Um, they've been there for years. Calendula is one that reseeds itself a little too readily. And that one's a little harder to keep up with the reed, weed seed rain. You'll have to do a lot of deadheading. So um, if you don't like a, a wilder looking garden, you may want to be a little bit more careful about having calendula. Um, or just keep it in one particular area and know that it'll come back from its seeds um, in subsequent years. And then this bright um, pink one is a uh, rose campion, um, which is a really nice player. And it, what is not pictured here is um, another great aspect of the plant has, it has um, the silver um, fuzzy foliage um, that looks great even after the plant or even before the plant is flowering and after the plant is flowering. But the key is, again, not letting those seeds rain down too much. Maybe you could leave one or two flat, uh, seed heads um, in an area and let those seeds um, set, but then get, every, get rid of everything else. <laughs> um, another thing that I finally went ahead and did this year, uh, after having Master Gardeners tell me about this, this trick um, for many years, 
um, is to save peony buds um, in the refrigerator for later enjoyment. Now it's way too late to do that this year, but um, next year, keep this in your back pocket. So on the left, as you can see here, these are pic this is a picture um, from June 20th of part of our peony collection. They smelled amazing. Um, and uh, the bud that I collected was, um, or the buds that I collected at that point in time were um, all of, in the same stage as the one that's just below the E in June. Um, you can see here, they were really tightly closed, maybe showing a little bit of color. I cut them on a day where it was um, pretty overcast and it had been a little bit rainy. You can do it earlier in the day too so that um, there's quite a bit of moisture in that stem. You quickly put it in a plastic bag and then quickly get it in the crisper of your refrigerator. Seal it tight and then um, wait a few weeks and then you can pull them out and enjoy them and they pop surprisingly quick. So within a day or two, um, they were at the stage that you'll see on July, the J July 30th um, picture. Um, one of the gardeners that uh, first told me about it, her child, uh, her son, um, was getting married in late July, but um, her future daughter-in-law really wanted peonies in her bouquet. So she was put to the challenge and was very happy with the results. So I encourage you to consider doing that to stretch your enjoyment of that great perennial plant. Um, I, I, I could do a whole multi-series talk on the importance of native plants, but um, I'll just give you a quick pitch here that um, late season right now is a great time to be thinking about sowing native plants. Um, and, and basically you're mimicking mother nature. A lot of our native plants are developing fruit or setting seed right now. And um, you're basically just putting um, your efforts into propagating those and helping those um, uh, be more prolific in your garden in the future. You can do that in pots or you can empty out a space in your garden that you really want to transition to more native plants um, and get some seed. Um, Wild Seed Project is a Maine-based um, nonprofit that works to increase the use of native plants in all landscapes. Um, in order to conserve biodiversity and encourage plant um, adaptation in the face of climate change and safeguard wildlife ha habitat and create um, pollination and um, migration um, corridors for insects and birds. So it's important to play a role in that. Um, our, our landscapes, we really need to rethink them. And, um, and I think it's really exciting that most folks that I talk to are already doing that. Um, or telling their neighbors about the importance of doing that. And I think there's, there's a great shift that's happening and, and I encourage you to um, join in that shift to host more native plants so that we can um, make some positive change in our, in our environment. Um, so if you're interested more in more information, the Wild Seed Project has a lot of great education. Not only do they sell the seeds on their website, but they have um, they want you to be successful. So they have really detailed growing tips for all the different native plants that they sell. Um, now you're providing food um, by putting in native plants that would provide pollen and nectar um, and maybe even shelter for these plants, I mean, for these insects, but um, it's important to also provide water for um, insects and even birds to small birds. Um, and one way to do that is to create a, a puddling area. And this is such a cheap and easy thing to do. Anyone can do it in their garden. You can grab an old um, shallow Tupperware dish or takeout dish <laughs> um, that can hold water um, and then put in sand or coarse rock or even just fill it with water and put some pieces of bark or rocks in, um, in that dish. And um, basically what you're doing is providing a water source where insects and birds have a landing place to be able to land and drink. Um, we think of bird baths as being a good water source for a variety of um, beings, but insects oftentimes have a real challenge in being able to access that water um, because they can't you know, sit down on something while they're, while they're getting their water. So um, all you need to do in this case is, um, this is just a, a beautiful little bird bath that um, a pair of uh, gardeners, Robin and Roberta, they had a milkweed garden um, and they wanted to provide water uh, resources in that milkweed garden. 
and um, they just put the rocks there and then they filled it up just so it, the water was peeking up um, between the rocks. You don't fill it so it's covering the rocks. Um, the insects will be able to get in there, even just you know allowing like a little muddy spot in your garden if you happen to have clay soils um, make sure that the clay soil stays wet um, whenever you're out there in the garden um, those little strategies can can be a big help for our insect friends um, so another thing to think ahead on is um, fall gardens can get kind of tired and um, and boring sometimes and and so there's a lot of plants that can still perform well as our seasons wind down um, so consider adding something new um, that you may not see in your neighbor's garden uh, these are some great ones that were uh, taken actually in well the bottom the bottom two were taken the second week of october last year and the funny story behind these are uh, we don't get a lot of visitors at Rogers Farm uh, that time of year. And I was doing a work session, I think, on a Thursday and this um, unsuspecting couple came by and was just wandering the garden. I was so happy to see visitors um, and I was so proud of these plants. I was like a, a kid that had gotten a new bicycle <laughs> and just was like wanted to show someone their new bicycle. I was just, I, I, I went up to him and I was told them I was happy that they were there and to enjoy their walk, but you have to go see these two plants because, you know, no one gets to see these. They're not um, really much to look at during the middle of the season. So they're really, really ignored. Um, but the gentian, which is the blue one um, on the, the left at the bottom left, really is that color. It is the most stunning color um, in the fall. It just stands right out. And especially if you've got the um, yellows, cheerful yellows that are, are typical in, in fall gardens, um, that contrast, that pairing is just really, really wonderful. And the boltonia, the thing that it's really hard to really appreciate in this picture is, well, there's two things. Um, the height, this particular plant is about five feet tall. It's huge um, and it is so incredibly sturdy. There's not a, um, a su plant support in there at all. It's in a windy site and this thing is standing upright just like a shrub. Um, and it um, fully dies back um, to the ground every year. The root systems persist. It's a, both, both of these are perennials, um, but it, it just, it's, sturdy, <laughs> doesn't need any support at all. And um, because it's such a pro prolific bloomer at such a late time of year, it is just buzzing literally with insect activity. So it's really um, a, a, just a, a total winner in a fall garden. Um, up in the upper right, this, gar this picture is uh, a little tricky to see, but um, I am showing it for a couple different reasons. This is an incredible raised bed. I highly recommend if you have any back troubles at all and are looking for a long-term garden solution. Um, we have instructions on our, our website as to how to build this V-shaped raised bed. Um, you can have the legs a little bit shorter and it's great for folks that use wheelchairs, um, but it's an incredible one if the legs are uh, long um, for folks that are planning on standing up and gardening. Um, but the plant that I want to point out in this particular one is this yellow one. And this is not a political statement. It just happens to be named Biden's. Um, and it is a very cold tolerant annual. It's not a perennial. It won't come back every year, but it is one that puts on a show for a very long time. You can see um, just to the left of it, there are um, million bells, also known as Calabracoa, um, in pink and purple. Those kind of, you know, they look okay, but they're not really putting on a big show in the fall. They, they can tolerate the cold, but the production of flowers really kind of slows down. Um, but Biden's, man, that is just, just covered in yellow right up until a very, very hard frost. Um, so again, don't let your fall garden be boring. So um, the next several slides, I'm gonna give myself a break from talking and show you some short video clips. Um, as I mentioned before, I wanted to hopefully inspire you to consider maybe some new ornamentals for your garden um, that you would have never thought of before. 
And um, some of these videos are me, and <laughs> I have to apologize in advance, they were shot on a very, very hot, muggy day. So I, I was saying that they're, they're sweaty selfies um, of me <laughs> in Rogers Farm talking about some of the gardens, that the, the, the things that I do for this job. Um, <laughs> so it's, I never thought I would have done these, but um, you do what you got to do. Um, and, but the better videos are of um, a local gardening legend and author and educator, Lisa Colber. And she generously um, uh, welcomed me into her landscape to capture some footage of her incredible home landscape and um, these are some highlights, but she, I just want to point out that she wrote the Maine Garden Journal, um, which is a highly regarded resource for Maine gardeners um, and regularly contributes to regional gardening blog for burpee seeds and plants. And she's also a master gardener in both Maine and Florida. So um, with that, I'm going to see if we can. And just a quick note, um, if the video seems a little too quiet for you, um, we have it as high up as we can. So I recommend you turning up the volume on your own devices, whether you're on a, on a laptop or an iPad or a phone. Um, and yes, I can identify with the sweaty selfies, but we all can over the last two weeks of weather <laughs> we've had here. So don't worry about that. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> Thanks. This is a plant that I hesitated to put in for a long time because I was told it wasn't hardy in uh, the Orono area. And uh, one day, I, or one year I did it anyway, it's Crocosmia. This variety is called Lucifer. And it's a spot near the road where there's reliable snow cover and I believe that makes a difference. It's in the Gladiolus family and it is an absolute hummingbird magnet. Uh, the two of them just flew by here. I'm going to be buzzed. Um, but uh, they just, um, they're in and out of here, and it's just a, a delight to see. They, this plant prefers full sun. Even when it's not in bloom, I love the way it looks because of the vertical statement it makes in the garden. It's just, a, it's a great plant. It, there is a corm, like the gladiolus corm, that uh, is easy to just pull out. Um, and in fact, maybe I can just, this one doesn't belong here. Oh, I can't pull it out reliably, but um, w if you loosen the soil, it's easy to pull some up and transplant somewhere else. So did that work okay for you guys? Yeah, I mean, it worked okay for me. Yes. Okay. okay, great. I'll show you another couple more then. This is another large leafed plant that I adore. It's called Duck's Foot Regersia. There are several varieties that you'll see. Some of them are darker purple. I kind of like this one uh, because the leaf has a shine to it. And in the fall, it takes on a reddish cast. Again, it is a, uh, it loves wet, mucky areas and it prefers being in deep shade. I'm standing here in front of Silphium perfoliato, which is also um, much easier to say as its common name, which is cup plant. It's a wonderful native plant that grows um, three to six feet tall. So you can see I am a little over five feet tall. So it's getting quite up there, even though we haven't had consistent rains early in the season to give it its full height. Um, and it's just a, such a cheerful yellow. Uh, it's a perennial and it is um, very resilient in terms of its ability to tolerate a wide variety of uh, moisture conditions. It does prefer full sunlight. It grows very, very well in full sun. And it's the reason why it's called cup plant is because the plant actually, the way the leaves are attached to the stem, it creates a little cup, which is a great, great spot for insects and birds to get a little bit of a drink um, while they're nectar, um, feeding on nectar and uh, pollen in the garden. The other thing that I really like about this particular plant is actually um, what happens when the petals fall off. You get these great, still attractive little buds. Um, these are the seed heads, and I had a we had a flower arranging 
program here at Rogers Farm years ago, and I remember one of the people, artists that did a pro the program, they made a boutonniere out of um, the remainder of the flower of the cup plant, which I thought was very, very clever. It's a nice green, very sturdy form, um, and just a really, really cool plant overall. So it's, it's tough to see in this video, but um, we have what appears to be a, a, a wall of uh, silphium or cup plant, cup plant um, along the border of the plot that I'm standing by um, in, in this case. Um, I mentioned that to warn you that it does spread. Um, it is a native plant, so it's an okay spreader, but it is something that needs, it, it needs to have the space to grow. Um, so it, its height and its, and its, you know, spreading habit can overwhelm a space. But in this setting, it is absolutely perfect. It is because this is a, a wide open area um, and it does provide like kind of a backdrop on, on this native plant garden. And um, it, it makes within the garden on the other side, make it seem a little bit more private. So it's good, but just be warned. <laughs> Okay. I'm here in front of balloon flower with the botanical name Platycodon grandiflorus and it's also a perennial plant that is quite hardy in Maine. It grows to be about um, two and a half feet tall and um, the, the thing that's a little bit tricky about this particular plant is that it emerges out of the soil um, a little bit later. So the stems don't show themselves as soon as uh, most of our traditional um, landscape plants. So sometimes people forget that it's there and stomp on it when they're working in the garden or just think it's not there and they go to replace it with another plant. So be patient with this one in the spring. It will appear usually about a week or two behind um, a lot of other um, perennial plants. I love this plant because it's such a kid favorite um, and also as grown up I, I can't stop myself when I go by um, because of, of what it's named for which is the balloon shaped flowers. The buds make a really fun popping noise when um, when you catch them at the right stage so hopefully it works this time. <laughs> oh it didn't. <laughs> I didn't pop it hard enough so there we go. <laughs> um, and they open up to these cheerful blue purple flowers that are pretty good sized um, flowers. They really put on quite a show when all of them are in bloom. Um, you do want to deadhead them if you want to prolong the um, bloom by just um, simply snapping off the spent flowers when they're when they're done. Just a couple more. And then we'll wrap up and give some time for questions. Oh, um, so one thing with the balloon flower is I always, we usually have um, summer camps in normal years, um, visit the farm in, in late July and August. And uh, those are always some of my favorite days of the year because it's fun to see the, the joy of the kids um, visiting the garden and show them some things that they may not have ever seen and, and welcome them to, to really be in a garden because sometimes when they're you know they've been to a, a botanical garden or on some kind of gardening tour or even visiting a friend's garden they're asked to not touch the plants and my my rule is touch the plants <laughs> and i give them some guidelines around that but that's one that i always do a, a head count on the balloon flower to make sure that we can have enough flowers for each kid to, to pop one um, there, especially if they're, well, if they're in there um, visiting at the right time of year. It's, it's great if you have kids or young people in your life. Okay. This is a, an interesting plant that loves a wet spot, wet and shady. It's called Astelboides tabularis. It's an interesting plant in that the stem comes up in the middle of the leaf. It almost looks like a um, lily pad. And um, it has flowers that I think are rather insignificant. There, it's in the rhubarb family. Uh, it's a plant that sort of looks like it came from dinosaur days. I've had this one in my shade garden for uh, many years. It kind of got 
battled out by uh, a few uh, bullies that I need to deal with. But um, it's especially fun in the early season um, in the deep wet shade. Uh, it, it is a little bit of a brighter green earlier. This is like as it, this is the time of year when it starts to transition into like a lighter green and yellowing. Um, but it just has just such an interesting leaf, really, really interesting leaf. It's a great conversation piece. I'm standing here in front of another native plant favorite, which is Veronicastrum virginicum, uh, also known as Culver's root. It's a very cold hardy plant. I've seen it listed as being cold hardy down to zone um, three. And um, it grows to be about three to six feet tall. Ours tends to be on the five and a half feet tall range here at Rogers Farm. And it is a great host to a variety of insects. You can see that the bees and insects, various insects, really enjoy the tubular shaped flowers that um, make up the really candelabra-like spikes, uh, bee inflorescence, that are all over this plant. It's a fantastic addition to um, any garden, but especially gardens that are with, uh, with the goal of uh, attracting insects and providing habitat. What I didn't mention in this video was the spidery and kind of tiered look of the foliage that you saw in that first image. Um, that is a really cool aspect of this plant. Um, if you step back from where I'm taking, the, where, where you're looking right now, you can see that um, the strappy leaves all actually are arranged in a whorl which means that they're all um, arising from the stem, not all, but groups of them are arising from the stem in the same plane versus being opposite or alternate from one another, um, which is what's typical of a lot of herbaceous plants. So it, it really just adds a really cool texture um, to the garden. And um, the flowers in this video are, are winding down. They really looked incredible about a week ago. Um, for actually two two week period ending about now. Um, so really, really nice. And I think this is the last one. This is Philictrum or meadow rue. It's a variety I believe is called black stockings. It's the leaves look somewhat like columbine leaves. They're sort of light and airy leaves. It's considered a see-through plant and it's it gets very very tall as you can see and it often does best in a wet situation i just love the way it's it's light and airy you can put a tall plant in front of other shorter plants if you have this effect it's not blocking what's beyond it seeds freely and uh, again is never a problem in the environment this is a really nice um, transition plant. If you've got a, you know, a spot in your landscape where you've got a little bit more of a formal garden and then you're trying to kind of buffer your garden and, and transition to a more woodland setting, which is like where, where Lisa's standing right here, um, this is a good plant to kind of soften that transition so it doesn't go from formal to wild too quickly. Um, and it is a relative of our white meadow root that you'll find in wet roadsides and, and meadow ditches and that kind of thing. Um, so it might look a little bit familiar. The white um, meadow root that you'll see uh, in, in our native landscapes um, is much smaller. Usually it's about five feet tall at the most. Um, so in summary, is the, the key is with gardening and what I love so much about gardening is that there's always the opportunity to try new things and always, I can't emphasize it enough, um, the opportunity to learn new things. It's a very humbling profession and a humbling hobby. Your gardens will always, once you think it, you know it all, <laughs> your gardens will teach you something new. Um, sometimes the hard way, but you always learn, learn a, a lesson. 
um, and make sure you take the time to, to simply enjoy your garden. I got to take my own voice and, and do that. And actually taking these videos um, has given me that, you know, forced me into that, um, which I, I do see as a silver lining at Rogers Farm. Uh, all I want to do is when I get there is just to pull weeds and, and get as much done. Um, but I know that having this footage is, is helpful and um, will hopefully help other gardeners. And so it's been nice to sit down, literally sit down with the plants in the case of balloon flowers, sit down next to right beside it and just enjoy it popping. <laughs> and then of course, just have fun. You know, it's, it's it don't, don't take gardening too seriously. Don't sweat it too bad when, when things die. Um, some of the best gardeners kill the most number of plants. I can speak to that myself. Um, but through that, you can have some gorgeous gardens and, and teach others along the way. Um, and this, this picture, I think, tells a nice story about how, you know, a fun way that we've enjoyed the garden. Usually when we have tours at Rogers Farm, again, I, I miss them deeply. Um, I encourage all the participants again, to be in the garden and touch the garden and take pieces of the garden. And we make these botanical souvenir bracelets, which basically is masking tape, sticky side out around your wrist. And as you're going along, you see something, you take a little piece of it and put it on the sticky side. And so it's great um, if you've got young visitors to your garden to welcome them to do that as well. They're not gonna pick off giant things. They're gonna pick off little things and, and that's really okay to do. So um, I've went a little bit longer than I expected, but hopefully we have time for a couple questions. Well, we have some questions in chat and I'm going to uh, run through those real quick because folks entered them. Um, and then we'll take questions from folks live on the call. So uh, the first question is from Eileen. Hello, Eileen. Uh, she wants to know, is the Garden Angel program still in place? So that's a great question. The Garden Angel program is still in place, but um, in-person visits are not allowed at this time, which is heartbreaking. We totally understand um, that uh, it, 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 the, the need is still there, just like at Rogers Farm, the plants still need people to tend them. Um, and just to give people a background, the Garden Angel um, program is a, a, a program that's active in southern Maine. We don't have the resources to be able to do it up in this area just yet, um, but it's where we match uh, extension staff, match trained master gardener volunteers with folks um, that have limited income and limited ability to, to tend their gardens. Um, and, um, and there's limited is a frequent word here. Um, we have a limited number of volunteers to be able to do that, but um, the ones that are able to be matched do incredible work and I, it's, it's really more than a garden mentor. It's, it's a, a really nice garden friend, I think, which I, I've heard some pretty touching stories about that program. So long story short is we're, we're looking forward to um, engaging volunteers in that again in the future, in the near future, hopefully. Um, but um, it, contact your local office if you are interested in learning more about it. Great stuff. Um, <clears throat> a second question uh, came in from an anonymous attendee. It says iPhone. Not sure who you are, iPhone, but your question uh, is, lately I'm having an invasion of both aphids and earwigs. Any advice on how to fight these? Aha. Well, um, aphids are surprisingly easy uh, in, in some cases. Uh, most outdoor cases, you can, um, number one, uh, knock them off with a forceful spray of water. And a lot of times aphids are flightless. Um, aphids are a really confusing insect actually because they can come in a few different forms and there's lots of different species but overall um, when they're flightless you can just knock them off with a forceful spray of water and that should should really do it some plants are an aphid magnet you probably found that already so things like lupin um, are especially attractive to aphids and you can use those as as a trap crop almost. If you wanted to make sure that the aphids stayed away from other things, um, you can plant those and then deal with the um, aphids that way with some soapy, um, like a, an insect, insect, insecticidal soap and just target your management on those particular trap crop plants. Um, but overall, that the more important story with aphids is they oftentimes don't do a lot of long-term damage to plants. So a lot of times they don't even need to be managed at all, which is a story that um, 
is important with a lot of insects in our landscape is that a lot of things that we you know, see as, as pests actually really don't do enough damage to really warrant doing anything about, um, which is a surprise. Um, so we really try to preach tolerance um, when, when it is okay to tolerate. We understand that there are some plants that are, you know, gonna, um, it's gonna be a concern and we do need to address uh, certain insect issues, but a lot of times it's just a matter of waiting it out. And, and also, letting the predators um, get, get, play a role as well. So there's a lot of insect predators for aphids. And so eventually, if you've got a population of insects, aphids, I mean, um, their predators will eventually come in. So you don't necessarily have to do all the work yourself. Earwigs, the trick um, with earwigs is to find, um, create like little traps, um, such as a small section of garden hose, old garden hose, you can just cut that um, into like a a yay long piece um, and lay it in your garden or wherever you're having problems and those aphids will, I mean not aphids, um, earwigs will go into that garden hose and in the morning, um, mid, mid morning on a sunny day, you go over and you pick that up and you knock it into a bucket of soapy water and you'll be surprised at how many you collect. Um, they, if you have other dark cool habit, habitats for the, uh, the earwigs to go into, in that area, that's gonna be less effective because they're gonna have other hiding places that they go into, but um, that is a trick that I found especially useful. Or a board, even just laying a piece of lumber, a small piece of lumber in an area, and then just picking it up and scraping it off into a bucket of soapy water will be a good little trap. Same with slugs, you can do the same thing with slugs. Good tips, thank you. Um, a question from Louise, who I know spends a lot of time in her garden. Um, I'm going to not say this word correctly, this plant, but um, she says, I noticed that you have scabiosa flower, and she says, I can't seem to locate it. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's an unfortunate name. Some flowers have the most terrible names. I feel bad for them. Um, so yeah, you did pronounce it right, scabiosa, um, and you can't locate it. Um, honestly, I haven't shopped for it recently. Uh, if you call around, I'm all about calling around to um, places that I need to shop nowadays um, to, to, to make my shopping experience more efficient. But I would definitely call around to local nurseries. And, and I was a buyer for local nurseries um, in the past. And oftentimes I was willing to go and do a special order. So if I've got a truck coming in, you'd be surprised at how many nurseries truck in plants from other places. Um, they might be able to add a plant or two on your, um, on, onto their next truck. This time of year, it's a little harder because they're not ordering as much. Um, let's see, a question from Mike and Della, who I think you know. Um, Mike and Della wanna know, what is a seed rain, big or otherwise? <laughs> seed rain is what keeps me up at night. Um, so we, it's a term that um, actually we use with weed management in particular. Um, so as we know, weeds are, a, a lot of weeds are very good at propagating themselves um, by seed. Others uh, propagate themselves by underground roots or, or stolons or, or whatnot, but mo most of our common weeds um, do a really good job of producing hundreds, thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of seeds per plant. And so when we allow those seeds to fully mature on the plant and drop down into the soil, that's what is what we refer to as weed seed rain. And so this is a really key time and I'll emphasize this a little bit more in my talk next week um, to really make sure that you, anything that you see that's flowering, get rid of as soon as you can. And if you ha don't have a lot of time in your garden, um, get the lawnmower out, <laughs> get the bag around that lawnmower and just mow them before they drop their seed into your garden. Cause some of those seeds can stay viable for 40, 50 years. Um, so again, that's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> Weed seed rain and that concept and the viability, long-term viability of those seeds. The more you can do, the, the more it's gonna help you out in the long run. There's a related question uh, from Jessica. She's saying, um, in regard to the seed rain challenge, are you pulling out the plant from the root or just deadheading and or pruning? 
Good, good question. So with weeds, I pull it out from the root uh, and if I can, if I have the time to do that. Um, again, mowing it uh, with our annual weeds, meaning that they just, they're, they, they're alive for one year, they produce seed and then they're dead. And then it's the next generation that's going to keep haunting you. You can just mow those and be okay with it. But like with poppies, I'm pulling those out because I know those are done. Those are annuals in this particular case, these poppies are. Um, the dill's an annual. So I'm pulling that out by the root just so I have a clean space to work with. And I'm like, for example, in the poppies, I'm going to be planting a crop of fall beets um, in that area. Um, so I'm going to be direct seeding and that loosened soil is nice to direct seed in. Um, and we will go from there. So I'm going to um, shut up now because I want folks to be able to chime in. So if you have a question for Kate, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, we'll just figure it out. But I want folks to ask their questions directly as well. Uh, Kate, I have a, a weed. <laughs> I know it's a weed. And I think it's called Creeping Jenny. And it is everywhere. And I do pull it out, but boy, it must, it must have great tenacity because it'll come right back and grow very quickly. So what's your question? Anything I can do about that? <laughs> Um, so it, I'm glad you brought that up because that's an example of one of the, um, the group of plants that actually is banned for sale. It was um, sold in the nursery trade up until um, just two, three years ago. My sense of time is terrible, but um, there is a group of plants, I think that's 33 plants that are not available for sale that um, did have some, you know, reason for it to be um, planted. Uh, and it, for the example that Della gives, uh, Creeping Jenny, it does have a nice green foliage and tearful yellow leaves, but it will outcompete a lot of our native species and just become a bear to deal with, as unfortunately you're dealing with. So um, with that particular one, since it's so low growing, um, hand pulling uh, is really going to be your main option. For taller growing invasive species, such as Japanese knotweed, repeat mowing is usually um, over the long term the best management strategy but that one you can't really mow because it's so it hugs the ground so well so unfortunately digging is is going to be your best bet um, there are some herbicides that would be effective and if you wanted to give me a call we can talk through what specifically to use in your particular site i'd have to do a little bit of work on that one but usually it's it's probably a broadleaf herbicide that you would use i tend to use that as a last resort because um, um, pulling is, is probably going to be your best bet. Um, well, and, and it's, it's growing in amongst um, evergreen uh, that uh, is a low shrub evergreen. So uh, I can't really use an herbicide. So I guess I just need to be uh, tenacious about getting out there and pulling it. And it's also on a hillside, so we have to be concerned about runoff, right? Yes, especially if you have surface waters nearby. Um, so yeah, tenacity is really, it's, it's, it's a war and not a battle. <laughs> yeah, sure. And you know, with that one, another strategy you might want to consider is to um, do a physical suppression where you um, do several layers of newspaper over it and then put bark mulch over it on top of it. So that might be a good um, mulching strategy. You wouldn't want to put just straight mulch over it because it'll just pop up through and say thanks for the nice moist environment um, but yeah. putting, putting several layers of newspaper over that and then bark mulch just so you're not looking at newspapers flying around <laughs> thank you i realize how much i talk with my hands <laughs> that's good that's why we love zoom Well, I never knew gardeners to be such a quiet bunch. Any other, any other questions for Kate? There's a few other in the chat that I, um, we can jump into. I did have a question. I didn't know if you could hear me. Oh, now we can hear you. Go ahead. Great. Um, I, I was actually asking my, my comments up there somewhere, um, how long a peony would last if you put it in the refrigerator? Good question. I honestly don't know. I have one batch left that I haven't pulled out. And so um, <laughs> touch base with me and I'll, I'll let you know whether that works out. I, I'm guessing that there's probably some information online. If you send me an email and I'll, I'll put my email address in the, the chat here, um, I can do a little bit of research. 
Uh, I have found that there's a lot of really amazing cut flower resources nowadays online too. I just personally um, tapped into one because I needed some quiet time um, is Floret Farmer. Um, they did a little webinar series, like there were five five minute videos on how to do different cut, man, uh, cut flower management strategies. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk about this particular tip, but um, if you're into cut flowers, I would definitely recommend um, finding Floret Farm. I believe that's what it is. And they're in the Pacific Northwest and they do, they're very generous with their um, educating the public about um, best practices. Great. Cut flowers. Right. I actually was asking for the same reason that you'd mentioned that my daughter's getting married in September. And I know that's probably kind of a stretch, but I was wondering if it was possible because we have some plants from my mother that I'd love to have as part of a wedding. And I'm guessing it's next year, so you can't have a whole season to practice, which is that's death. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we've got a question. Uh, Elaine Redmond, you've, you've uh, raised your hand. Thank you for raising your hand. I love that. Go ahead with your question. Oh, you're on mute. You have to unmute first. Unmute. There we go. Former teacher, so yes, you have to raise your hand. I have a <laughs> question about Queen Anne's lace. Is there anything you can do to get rid of it? That's a biennial um, and a good example of um, importance of managing weed seed rain. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it, a biennial basically has a, a two year life cycle. And so what you're seeing now in flower is the end of its life. Um, it's gonna flower, produce seed, and then it's done. Um, and so if you can keep it from dropping seed into the area by mowing it before it drops seed is really important. Um, that's gonna reduce what's, what you're gonna be seeing in the future. And if you can commit to that over the long run, um, you'll eventually, your weed seed bank, um, the bank of seeds that are inevitably in your soil right now, um, will eventually all germinate and grow and, and not drop any more seed and, and that population will be depleted over the long run. Um, it's, it's a challenging one for sure. It's a really good insect habit, uh, you know, an insect uh, a food source, um, but in the wrong place it can be challenging. Yeah. I also had a problem with loose strife i think that's what it is it had little tiny worms on it hmm. that might be i think oh i'm being recorded so i don't know <laughs> i don't know for sure um i'll say start out here i think loose strife has a, a biological control now um and those insects might be if it's the invasive um loose strife. I think there's an insect that actually feeds on the seeds. I'd have to do some research to, to refresh my memory on that one, but that might be what you're seeing. Is it the purple loose strife that you're dealing no, with? No, it was yellow. Oh, the yellow, the world one where the flowers all come out at the same level? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd, you can, you're welcome to send me some pictures of the insects if you're looking for that. Well, I just dug it up. I went through three years of it having the, these little worms and I said, okay, <laughs> I didn't want it to get into my other plants. So I did the best I could, but I think there's still roots there. Yeah, that one does have persistent roots. Um, a lot of times insects and disease, especially diseases are very host specific. So um, there's some exceptions to that rule like aphids and Japanese beetles, but a lot of cases insects on one plant won't necessarily mean they, those will be issues on other plants. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for great questions. Any other questions? And before we have the final questions here, uh, just a note, if you can't see it, uh, Kate has dropped her email address very bravely into the chat. So um, I'm sure she would not be opposed if you had further questions or want to send her some photos of some strange worms from your garden. She'd be happy to uh, help you figure out what's going on in your own backyard. Uh, but any further questions or final questions for Kate? I have a question. Um, Kate, I'm new to the website and I appreciate this great tour of all kinds of cool stuff and I'll be checking it out. But I, uh, I mostly shade. I have uh, 
some sun on the south side, but it's it's um, 30 year plus old trees sort of shaded. Is there a shade section on the site? We do have, um, if you're scrolling through on the main garden and yard website, I didn't scroll down far enough, but there are circles that have images of different categories of um, topics that we cover. So soils and composting, um, plants for the main landscape is the one that you're going to want to look at. And um, in there, there's um, listings of plants for specific challenging situations like wet shade, dry shade, you know, wet sun, deer resistant one. I, well, I don't know if we have a deer one, but um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's very excited about that one now. Um, I'm, we might have that. Um, uh, but, you know, again, plants for challenging situations. So there are two lists for shady ones. Um, I'm, there's the, I always look at those lists and wish I could add a few more. Um, so if you're looking for other inspiration, um, feel free to give me a shout and some pictures too of the site. And I'd be happy to make some suggestions. I have a lot of shade myself in, in certain parts of our landscape. One thing that I really love as a ground cover is... Um, uh, uh, climbing hydrangea. People don't think of that as one, but it's a great I ground have cover. One. I have one, but it's, I hope it's going up an oak tree. It's just really started taking off this year. So, uh, but I, I love the shade plants I have. I'm just always looking for something that I can cheat with a little bit. So, um, so, so thank you. And thank you for this great site. And, uh, and thank you. Jaffet, is that how I say your name? Thank Jafet, you, yeah. Jafet, Jafet, thank you for helping with the chat and all this stuff. This is marvelous. No. I'm happy. I'm happy. I found this. Thank AARP for putting it on Facebook. Oh, thank you, Marianne. I appreciate that. Um, I just made sure we get to everybody because I was I, I didn't realize that Ginny. I think you had your hand up. Uh, I just want to make sure if you have a question that we get to it. Do you want to unmute yourself or just tell us? No, I I don't have anything. I think I was waving. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, uh, if that is it, we are going to wrap up. Uh, just a quick reminder that we will be back here next Friday, same time, 10 a.m. Um, for uh, with Kate for the edible uh, conversation. So if you enjoy growing your own, this will be a good opportunity. Uh, all are welcome. So feel free to spread the word. Um, you'll see it on Facebook um, and it will have uh, a link to our RSVP page, which will send you the Zoom information. Um, I want to thank um, Kate for making some time for us now uh, for this series. And we're, we're hopeful that if folks um, enjoyed this series as sort of a first dipping our toe into the water here, that you'll uh, encourage us or ask for more of these um, headed into the fall. I don't want to uh, promise all of Kate's time because she's fairly busy, as you can see. Um, but I think a lot of folks would appreciate more of this. Um, even heading into the colder winter months.